peace, that's hard, man. That's a hard thing to attain. And so you have the intense battleground of ideas. And, you know, the people who are concerned about, uh, let's say, offense, like they have their point. You know, words can hurt and they can hurt deeply, but they don't hurt as much as sticks and they don't hurt as much as knives. So it's a little bit of what ails you, you, you might say, to stave off something far worse. And that doesn't mean that the intensity of discussion, I mean, you can have discussions that are incredibly upsetting, but the question is, well, what do you have when you don't have them? And if you think that what you have by not having those discussions is peace, then you're either naive, willfully blind, or malevolent. Those are the options. So, I mean, I've seen in my clinical practice, one thing I got deeply convinced of, and it wasn't something I wanted to be convinced of, I would say, is the end of the argument anyways, because the probability that you are revealing in your opposition to my thought something that will then reveal itself within me in opposition to my thought is almost certain. And so we have to hash through the ideas to make peace. And, you know, the idea, if free speech, you say free speech has fallen out of fashion, it's like, was thought fallen out of fashion? Because they're the same thing. Most people, I would say 95%, you know, 6% of people buy books. Okay, how many people engage in internal, dialogical, critical self-evaluation? 10%, maybe? You, you, it takes a lot of training to think what you have to do. A thought has to reveal itself to you in the theater of your imagination. And so that happens to everyone, to, to your less And that's just, your rights are not a social construct. That's just simply not the case. It's not the case psychologically or physiologically for that matter. So. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for having the courage to pursue the truth, and I'm very proud that you're Canadian, especially since truth has been so fraught lately in Canadian politics. Um, my question is, what would you say to someone who has been through a traumatic experience and wants to avoid the culture of victimhood that encourages people to identify with their trauma and capitalize off of being the most victimized um, person? Okay, well, there's two things that I addressed there. People say this courage, they say, they talk to me about my courage fairly frequently, and that's not right, exactly. I, I just learned to be afraid of the right thing. And I remember she was in pain, and, but she needed to go to school, and well, one of the things we told her was, don't use your illness as an excuse. Right, because you're already in trouble, kid. You know, you got your problems, and it, they're serious. But if you can hold on to the distinction between the part of you that can, in spite of this, and the part that can't because of it, and not blur that distinction, then that's one more thing you have on your side while you're attempting to struggle through this. And to her credit, she managed that, and quite pristinely, and that was extraordinarily helpful. It was very difficult at times uh, after she had had her hip replaced. She, she couldn't get around that well. And so we decided to put her in a motorcycle course, which was rather a terrifying thing to do since she just had a hip replacement, but she needed to have a scooter to get around. And so she went with her mother to this motorcycle uh, course and they were driving motor